I will say that I believe that you can transfer cultural knowledge if it's not an abusive relationship where the language is being taken away, which a lot of times our languages were taken away in an abusive sort of way with the Indian boarding schools and, and literal abuse to if you speak your language. But if, if it can happen in a more comfortable context, and you know, we've actually switched in our community from Chinookan to Chinookwawa and Fualtamish, Fualtamish being the lower Chalis language. I mean, there's you know, a, a shift through time from speaking Chinookan to speaking Fualtamish, which is, was kind of a more useful language because more people spoke that Salish language than Chinookan because originally, we spoke our neighbors' languages, and they didn't speak Chinookan. It's just how it worked. People didn't think they could learn Chinookan, so that's all the way. Same up at Yakima, the uh, Waskos and Wishkum, and that they, you know, they learned to speak Sahoptin or Ichishkin, but Ichishkin speakers didn't learn to speak Kicht, which is their language. So you know, we have had these transitions, and even to speaking English, and if it's been in the right context, a lot of information can go from language to language. And so, you know, and we're fortunate for that because we have gained a lot or kept a lot of our information even through to English speaking. But by speaking these languages, the way that you perceive the world and other people and yourself is very different. You know, the way that you talk about even thinking in Chinook or Chinook Wawa is so different than how people think about thinking in English. And I think it's important. So maybe we will flip through some of these. Yes, I know we're totally not enough time to do what we need to do. Uh, you know, these are, this is just an example. You might want to just flip. You could, this is, by the way, so this is primarily built to be the education piece for the teachers teaching the kids. So this is kind of a lot of the background information, and this is just the material about Hazel. Like I was saying, we actually have this entire slideshow also in Chinookwa. It's a PowerPoint, but it just exists as information for our teachers to be able to pull from to, uh, to teach the kids. But this is, like I say, the fruition of a lot of work over probably 10 years or more, just thinking about talking with elders, looking at baskets, weaving ourselves, whatever, just thinking about Hazel. So you might just flip and you can see some of this stuff here. It just, you know, everything from advanced information down to, you know, just advanced aboriginal knowledge. But just, I would say, just keep flipping. This is just illustrating the difference of wild growing hazel versus shoots. Shoots are, to get shoots, like on the right, you have to, uh, you know, modify the environment, you either burn or cut, what have you. You can so see just showing if uh, you know wild versus pruned. This is some of the bugs that affect it if it's not been burned. <coughs> you know, burning helps with bug infestation. So this is all just knowledge that we're trying to pass on, or, uh, eventually to the kids here. Uh, you might go back, there's a nice little aside there, that's one of our elders' teachings, or really more than one. There may be buds or tiny leaves just the size of a squirrel's ear. <laughs> when uh, leaves on a hazel are that size, that's when it's uh, perfect for peeling. Because if you don't get it right in the spring and peel it at that time, then uh, you know there's other methods you can use prior to that, you know, the sap running to, to uh, get the bark off, but it's a lot more labor intensive than this kind of moment right at spring when the bark will come off. Anyway, you can keep going. <coughs> Just showing how it peels. Sorting and cooking. This is the other way to, to assure that the bark comes off good. You cook it till the sap's uh, Sap's boiling a little bit under the bark, and you can keep going. And then that, that's burnt ones on the left versus fresh ones on the right. And you can see these are examples of old baskets that you can see where some of the burning had went a little too far to scorch. So just for people's information, we bundle them up and soak them. Lots of quotes from elders here in both Chinook and English. but. 
once it's been soaked a couple of weeks, the bark will pretty much just slough off. So, and preparing them for weaving. And well, just different illustrations here put together. And it, it, while you're flipping through there, here, let me grab something. Should I keep flipping? Yeah, flip. So we've developed something. We've developed this piece of curriculum around hazel, which we call Tukwila, which people know the town of Tukwila by Seattle. That actually means uh, hazel switch, you know, Tukwila. We've built something very similar for juncus. We're building something similar for cedar bark. Um, as you go, you know, this starts to just show examples of different weaves for hazel. Hazel is actually really thoroughly used here in this part of the, port, you know, like Portland Basin, Wapato Valley. Um, as soon as you get out of cedar country, of course, we have nice cedar right here, but if, as you're going up the river, uh, hazel gets used really uh, thoroughly for, you know, twisted rope and a whole number of things of interest, plus all these great baskets, of course. But this is all just a small part of a larger curriculum that has you know, any number of other uh, things associated with it. We've developed, uh, uh, you know, packets of material, for instance, so the kids can have access to just the, what the raw material looks like. We have ongoing field trips for the kids to be out on the ground. The kids actually have relationships with individual plants uh, that they are with all the time, you know, all throughout the year. They're there, at least, you know, multiple times a year they see what these plants are doing and what they look like and they're involved with getting them, you know, pruning them, seeing the new shoots, you know, people have a long, long you know, nice long-standing relationship with these, these plants and uh, plant communities and that um, multiple examples we've developed. Hey, she was just on the uh, slideshow, Tony. <laughs> so, you know, uh, example sets of these things from the starts all the way through to finish. Uh, examples in pipe cleaner, because the earliest kids actually, the youngest kids, we actually start them even in, in pipe cleaner as an example to show them how to play in twine. They can see with a different color in the examples where the next, uh, you know, how the next, you know, weaver comes in or new spokes come in just by putting them in different colored pipe cleaner, you know, just at anything you could imagine to help illustrate this, give the information to the kids. These are uh, some examples of also pieces of this curriculum, which are, uh, so this one's called Gathering Hazel Shoots, and it's just, uh, you know, a story illustrated by an elder, and it's just, you know, speaking, it's all in Chinook. But it's speaking about, uh, about what you do. Here's the squirrel ear illustration, right? <laughs> or chipmunk ear.